Beyond the pyramids, beyond all you think you know, lies an undiscovered Egypt. There are archaeological horror stories. Death was not an end, but the beginning of eternity. It's simply a changing of state. It was an underworld that rewarded the worthy, but the wicked had cause to beware. What awaited was every Egyptian's greatest nightmare. Now, Peter Woodward guides you through an Egypt few are privileged to see. Egypt Beyond the Pyramids. Thirty-five centuries before the Christian era, and some 2,500 years before the Old Testament prophets, ancient Egyptians were already pondering the deepest, most mystifying subject of human existence. All societies struggle with the greatest mystery of life, death. But few have approached death with greater directness or with such enormous respect, ceremony, and ritual as the ancient Egyptians. For them, death was just one of a whole series of cycles. The Nile rose and fell, crops were planted and harvested, a person lived and died. But if you were properly prepared, the greatest cycle of all began after death. From the dawn of their history, Egyptians believed strongly in the concept of an afterlife, an existence which could continue for eternity. For these early people, death was simply a transition. In ancient Egypt, death was ever before the people. Because to them, it wasn't the great end that it is to us. It's simply a changing of state. And uh, of course, they're, they're going to go on living. And their spirit, their life force, their personality is going to be able to transcend all the actual trauma of death and go on into the next life. The Egyptian concept of eternal life was somewhat different than that of the Christian cultures which would follow in later centuries. Egyptians were not hoping for a better life, some celestial paradise after death. They simply wanted a continuation of the life they knew and loved here on Earth. An enormous amount of energy in Egyptian society was taken up with the rituals surrounding death. In studying these ancient rites, archaeologists try to learn not only how people died, but, hopefully, more about how they lived. How do you deal with death? It's the old question. Archaeologists are still trying to find out how the ancient Egyptians answered it. We're picking our way through some rice paddies. So we are. Here in the Nile Delta, on our way to an excavation of a very early burial site. It's Old Kingdom, 4,500 years ago. Dutch Egyptologist Willem van Haarlem leading an international dig there. And if we don't break an axle as we go along, then we're almost there. Most of Egypt is desert, and the bodies of ancient Egyptians buried there have remained intact for thousands of years. But conditions in the Nile's delta region are very different. Here, the many branches of the Great River feed a water table which is very close to the surface. Most things buried in the delta mud decompose quickly. I joined Willem van Haarlem at the ancient cemetery he is excavating in the delta region. For archaeologists like van Haarlem, this is a frustrating place to look for the past. Should we yes. go and have a look yes, at that? We can. Right. But I was lucky enough to arrive on a day when a body from an early grave was being removed for study. Willem introduced me to Alexei Kohl, a specialist in human bones from Russia. So, Alexei, tell me what you have here. What sex is this skeleton? We know that uh, it was a male about uh, 25, uh, 35 years old. 
and uh, we didn't observe any trace of uh, disease on his bones. So this was quite a healthy person? Yes, quite healthy. So here we have the, the legs and this is the pelvis yes, area? legs, uh, pelvis, uh, you can see arms here. And uh, the ribs? Here. Yes, yes, ribs, yes. And, and this, is, this is the skull? In yes, this, this, this is the skull and uh, you can see uh, the jaw, the jaw here and uh, With teeth. the teeth? And uh, 13 beads. How old is, is the skeleton? Um, very broadly spoken, between 2500 and 2000 BC. So it's between 4000 and 4500 years old. But even with this crude burial, th there are offerings placed here which would suggest that even at this early stage there was a very strong sense of the afterlife and where this person was going after death. Absolutely. And these vessels probably contain some kind of foodstuff. In, in other burials we found fish bones in uh, these uh, vessels. So that may have been fish in, and in some way preserved, salted or something like that. So you're going to be taking the bones out today and, and the offering jars perhaps? Yes. And if you want, you can uh, help us by taking out some of the beads, for example. That would be great, thank you. No Egyptian was buried without preparation for the life to come. This man was sent to eternity with a necklace. I was able to find several stone beads from that necklace, which will be ah. saved for further study. So, that's the next one. How do you keep track of all these? Well, we, we give this number three because there's a small one in between we haven't taken out yet. Uh -huh. And then we put them in film boxes with the number written on it. So we can reconstruct the exact order according to the sketch I made. You must have thousands of film boxes. Yes, we have. They're very <laughs> useful for taking samples and small finds and things like that. Yeah. Oh, well, there's... For as much as Van Gallem and his colleagues are learning about this 4,000-year-old man, there is much we will never know. What was his name? What did he do to earn his living? Did he have a family? What we can be sure of is that he hoped he could find his way to eternal life. But moving from the world of the living to the everlasting life of the dead was not automatic. It was a complex and highly ritualized event which could only be successfully negotiated by those who had lived a moral life. And even they had to be prepared to overcome many obstacles. Passage to the afterlife occurred in a region the Egyptians called the Underworld. And presiding over this deeply mysterious realm was the great god Osiris. The spirit of the dead person was taken before Osiris and a court of 42 other judges. Here the spirit was asked a complex series of questions or riddles about his or her life. Giving the correct answers to these riddles was vital to gaining the afterlife. They had to pass a moral and ritual test before they could enter the afterlife. Uh, there was a judgment of their moral and uh, ethical value. They then had to become empowered with magic in the afterlife so that they could defeat the many dangers which existed there. The most critical part of this examination was known as the weighing of the heart. In this ceremony, the heart of a deceased candidate was weighed against a feather. If the heart balanced the feather, the person could enter the afterlife. With so much riding on such tests, it was only natural the ancient Egyptians would look for help. While the physical body was being mummified and entombed, the spirit was undergoing its great journey through the underworld in the hope of being reborn in the afterlife. Now, there were maps, guides to this journey. They're commonly called the Book of the Dead, and it's parts of that that you'll find on the walls of every tomb. They were directions, instructions to the departed spirit. Sometimes these, these funerary texts go to the extent of either describing or even providing a map of what the afterlife is like and what are the routes through the afterlife. And that's very important because the routes are very dangerous to follow. For those who failed the exhaustive examination for entrance into the afterlife, what awaited was every Egyptian's greatest nightmare. 
Those who were judged unworthy were cast into hellish pits and tortured. Those who failed the test were fed to the great beast, Amit, the eater of the dead. But for a people who so loved their land and the life it gave them, perhaps the greatest fear was the thought of spending eternity without their beloved Egypt. His name was Mazeharti, general of the army, high priest of Amon-Re, and one of the sons of the pharaoh Pinejem I. He suffered from severe headaches. We have some of the letters he wrote to his doctor asking for a cure. Well, maybe it didn't work, though he lived to the relatively advanced age of 52. But for all the details we know of his life, to the visitors to this museum, he is just a mummy. From the Greeks and Romans to the Hollywood screenwriters, no part of Egyptian life has more fascinated the world than mummification. And this is a very successful example, which means that as far as Mazaharti is concerned, he is still alive. The world's fascination with mummies is not a recent phenomenon. Napoleon was intrigued by mummies when he invaded Egypt in 1798. Early archaeologists seemed obsessed with these preserved corpses. Other than gold, nothing dominated their efforts more than looking for mummies. But in their zeal, they weren't always too careful in the way they handled the dead. The result was an imperfect understanding of the meaning of mummification and how this remarkable practice came about. Ancient Egyptians believed that our friend Masahete could continue to live after death only if his body had been preserved. I think the fact that they did go to so much trouble makes it very clear that the actual body was going to have some continuing existence in the afterlife and that they would be able to re-inhabit their body and their body would be able to take on the form of a, of a living being again. It was critical that the dead person's spirit be able to find its own body, which was the base or home for the spirit. The corpse had to be as recognizable as possible. In the earliest years of Egyptian civilization, preserving the body had been fairly easy. The dead were simply buried in shallow pit graves. The hot desert sand ensured that the body tissues dried out before the corpse could rot. But as Egypt became more sophisticated, people began to want a resting place that was more than just a pit in the sand. By 3400 BC, upper-class Egyptians were being buried in tombs above the ground. But without a bed of dry sand, their bodies decomposed. What was needed was a better method of preservation because without the body, there would be no chance of an afterlife. It took the best part of a thousand years, but what evolved was a highly complex system of mummification. The earliest methods entailed little more than wrapping the body in linen and covering the linen with a liquid resin. But as time passed, it became apparent to Egyptians that, like all organisms, the human body's internal organs were the first to decay. By the fourth dynasty in 2600 BC, they began removing these organs, and true mummies at last appeared. The process became progressively more sophisticated until it reached its peak in the New Kingdom, some 1500 years before the Christian era. Making a mummy began with evisceration. The brain came out in small pieces through the nose. The stomach, lungs, liver and intestines were taken out through a small incision. Each of them was placed in a special canopic jar, just like these. These jars were then stored close to the mummy so that the spirit could recognize his or her spare parts. Not all people were mummified in the same way. 
Like a car buyer being offered a choice between leather or fabric seats, six or eight cylinders, the family of the dead in ancient Egypt could choose what sort of mummy they wanted. Both the lower and the upper classes all hoped to preserve the body to the best of their abilities, but of course it was a matter of economics. So lower classes couldn't necessarily afford detailed mummification. There were different levels of mummification in Egypt, even though most mummification was only available to the better off people anyway. But within that group, uh, there were less expensive and more expensive uh, means of doing it. And obviously for a pharaoh, uh, he would have the very best uh, processes available. For the pharaoh's body, the act of mummification was an exacting process which lasted some 40 days. The most precious ingredients were used to anoint the body. Resins from pine and juniper trees were carried from the land of present-day Lebanon. Frankincense and myrrh were brought from today's Somalia and the Arabian Peninsula. Cinnamon and beeswax were also used to scent the corpse and seal the body. Once the body had been prepared, it was carefully wound in linen strips right down to individual fingers and toes. As centuries turned into millennia, the quest for the ideal mummy continued. Recognition of the mummy was so critical, Egyptians sought any technique which would help to preserve the likeness of the dead. The great pharaoh Ramesses II's most obvious facial feature was his large, hooked nose. Preserving this distinctive nose required an innovative solution. Zero radiographs made in 1977 revealed that the pharaoh's nasal cavity had been filled with dozens of peppercorns to ensure the legendary nose could be recognized for eternity. In the New Kingdom, they had started inserting small onions under the eyelids because eyes are mainly water. So when you desiccate them, they all get sunken in. So for various of the royal mummies, we have small onions inserted in so that they have a nice naturalistic lump so they look like they're just sleeping. Painted stones also replaced eyes. Sawdust, straw, sand and lichens were all used at various times to stuff or mould facial features into some approximation of lifetime appearance. We don't know much about the people who actually performed the process of embalming the dead. We do know that the final wrapping of the mummy was often done by priests wearing masks of the god Anubis, the deity responsible for mummification. Once the wrapping of a pharaoh's mummy was complete, it was often covered with a funerary mask, bearing the likeness of the pharaoh. The most famous of these is the fabulous golden mask which covered the face of the New Kingdom boy king, Tutankhamun. Most experts agree that by the time the Roman Empire had taken over Egyptian civilization in the first century BC, the standards of mummification had changed. Although the practice remained of critical importance to Egyptians, the quality of work done by embalmers often slipped. There are, you know, archaeological horror stories of unwrapping what looks like a perfectly viable mummy and finding that it's actually the parts of several bodies which have just been pushed together but identified to the family as Mr. X or Mrs. Y and, and given to them as the body to be buried. Um, so that it looks like the, that embalming became a, a pretty sloppy process very often. What never changed was the belief that the mummy must be identifiable to the deceased. These wonderful portraits of the dead were painted on boards and placed over the faces of mummies. They appear Roman in style, but they are in fact the faces of Egyptians. They stare out at the ages in the hope they will be granted their wish to spend eternity with their gods. Just as the process of mummification had slowly evolved, so did Egyptian attitudes about where to bury their loved ones. The earliest Egyptians had been buried in the sand, by the time of the first pharaohs, the concept of death and the afterlife had become more sophisticated, and Egyptians began to look for better ways to entomb the dead. 
Over 3,000 years before the Christian era, Egyptian attitudes towards burial began to change. Simple pits in the desert were no longer seen as adequate. What was needed was a more permanent, substantial home for the dead, a structure with space for all the things that the dead would need on his long journey through to the afterlife, and a space for offerings and food for his refreshment. The kind of tombs which evolved are known today as mastabas. They were simple rectangular structures with a single burial chamber. Groups of mastabas became cities for the dead. As funerary practices became more complex, so did the mastaba tombs. Egyptians believed that as long as the dead was honored and his name repeated, that person remained alive. Separate chambers were added to the mastabas where friends and loved ones could pay homage to the deceased and offer prayers in his name. For Egyptians, the dead person's spirit frequently returned to the body to rest and take refreshment. So food, water, even wine was brought to the mastaba for the deceased to enjoy. Hundreds of mastabas were built here on the Giza Plateau. All around us are buried the high officials and attendants at the court of the pharaohs. Most of these tombs were excavated in the 1930s, but some remained hidden. Dr. Anne Roth of Howard University is leading a team here to explore this whole field of mastabas. They're trying to find the missing tombs and to learn more about the burial practices of the Old Kingdom. Mastaba tombs like the one I'm sitting on were built in the Old Kingdom period and even earlier as uh, sort of artificial mounds that would cover the body of the dead person. And we're coming back to some tombs that were excavated in the, mostly in the late 1930s and trying to find out by looking at them a little more carefully if we can trace the activities of the people who built them and the people who owned them and the people who worked here as priests and the people who visited here as tourists and really sort of reconstruct the life in the cemetery. So this is one of the mastabas that you've been re-excavating? Uh, not this one, actually, the one over there. Brad spent a couple days clearing off where this mastaba had fallen down over this one, and immediately when he started clearing the actual surface of the mastaba itself, he found first one burial chamber and then another. And these are unusual because they don't seem to have shafts uh, above them. We haven't quite figured out how they got into them. They may have actually buried the people and then built the whole mastaba over the top of them. So, Brad, Hi, you've been Hi. busy. <laughs> yes. Tell me what you found here. Well, when we first opened the chamber, there, uh, there was the top of a skull, so we knew that there was a burial here. Uh, this one is apparently a rather young woman, uh, perhaps somewhere around 18. And we can tell that from the way that the bones have uh, not quite completely fused. And as you grow, of course, the bones change. The burial here is only one of two burials that we think we've got in this tomb. Uh, he, we were looking for the shaft of that, and while we were looking for the shaft, we ran across a second one, which I think you're about ready to open, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. This body is uh, partially excavated, but in this other spot, we have a, probably a complete burial. It's extraordinary. Let me have a look. Allison, we've got another body for you. Can you see anything down there? I can see a, a, a skull. Would that be a tibia or a leg bone? Yes, mm. it's a leg bone. What will you do now in order to uncover this, this skeleton? <laughs> well, I'll do a lot of sweeping, trying to carefully not move the bones. The problem with these burials are, as you've noticed, it's a very small space. Basically, it does, it does look disturbed. Mm -hmm. It's, um, to say the least, <laughs> possibly female. <laughs> um, the bones are pretty small, clearly an adult. All right, we'll have to dig it out and find out what it is, who it is. Great. Great, Mabruk, another body. Excavating bodies is a, is a sort of scary thing to do, actually, because they are, they are people, and we have to remember they are people, and we try and treat them with a lot of respect. We had one body that was found with the, the hands underneath the, the head, and the head was resting, and the hands were resting on a little stone pillow. Um, it tells you almost something about their personality. And it's, there's a real sense of connection with, uh, with these ancient people that were buried in these tombs. 
This is the skull of a woman who died about 4,400 years ago. She was between 30 and 39 years old, probably about 35. Um, and so dying, dying at that age was not uncommon. She's been kind of interesting. She has an active dental abscess. The abscess, um, you can see it here. It's in her left first molar. And you see these two holes here probably very painful and possibly um, related to her death. Uh, it is possible to die from an untreated dental abscess. The Egyptians had a very high rate of tooth wear because they ground their uh, grain on stone grindstones and that put a lot of grit into the flour and there's a lot of ambient dust. And so you can imagine that a lifetime of eating bread made that way, it's like chewing on sandpaper. Through their work, Anne Roth and her colleagues may be offering the ancient people they study the eternal life they so desired. We hope we make them live longer by studying them and telling something about their lives because the ancient Egyptians believed that part of your soul was what other people thought of you. So by forming these human connections with these dead people again, we hope we're atoning for any disrespect that we may be showing to their bones. The bones contained in these mastabas at Giza belonged to common middle-class people. But even for pharaohs, death at last arrived. Egyptians believed that when their king passed on, he joined the great god Ray to endlessly carry the sun across the sky in a celestial boat. To make sure the pharaohs had a craft at their disposal for this important journey, boats such as this were sometimes buried near the royal tombs. At first glance, this would seem to be an unlikely spot to find such a royal boat, much less a fleet of them. These huge walls are almost all that remain of a vast complex of mortuary temples. They were built in the desert near the ancient town of Abydos to honor dead kings who ruled Egypt almost 5,000 years ago. It was here in 1991 that Dr. David O'Connor of New York University's Institute of Fine Arts made a startling discovery. The first of a number of boats buried just outside these walls. New discoveries were being made even as I arrived. Matthew Adams is associate director of the project. He explained how these ancient vessels were first found. We noticed initially in our work, there were some very unusual walls poking up out of the sand just in this area. Let me I show can you. see them, yes. Initially, we thought that uh, these were the walls of some building. You can see the mud bricks here, and just a bit of the original plaster face of the wall. But they had these unusual shapes at the end. Here's a corner, and the end comes around and is curved, rounded. So what, what was the answer to the mystery? <laughs> the answer to the mystery is that these walls contained, were built to contain wooden boats. The boats were placed in a small pit, then the brickwork was built up against the outside. Each one of the boats inside these structures is filled with mud brick, and then the whole thing was capped off with a nice mud plaster. And they're actually in there now, those wooden boats? There are wooden boats inside these structures right now. And, and what's the boulder? The boulder, we think, is some kind of symbolic anchor to permanently or eternally moor the boats in place. It's amazing. So what you have here is, is walls surrounding an actual wooden boat, and this is the, the prow or, or the stern of the boat? And We're not quite sure whether it's the prow or the stern, it's which end is the front or the back. It's a clear shape, though, isn't it? Very clear, yes. How long is it all together? Uh, the longest is about 90 feet by about 10 or 12 feet wide. 90 feet? 90 feet. But these would be substantial things, wouldn't they? Very substantial craft. It's a big job clearing away the tons of sand which cover these boats. After that, the plaster caps must be carefully removed and one can begin to sense what these boats once looked like.
As the sand is swept away, it's possible to reveal the wooden planks of the long, narrow vessels placed here almost 5,000 years ago. Wow, look at that. Here you actually see a number of the longitudinal planks which ran the length of the boat. You can see the spaces between them. So these planks seem to be really thick here. That's right. They're about uh, between two and three inches thick. Uh, and we're not quite sure about the length yet. We don't have enough exposed. And, and what wood is this? It seems to be cedar wood from modern Lebanon. It's a thousand miles away. That's right. So th the shape of it, this would be the bottom of the hull, and then the hull would come up like this. And, and what's this here? This is, these are, this is the actual wood that's left along the sides of the hull. And these, these holes, is, is, is it this insect eating these holes? Or no, what? these are actual holes that were cut in the wood when the boat was constructed for the rope lashings that held the planks together. They were woven through here. Here's a set, here's a set, here's another one here. Debbie, what exactly are you doing there? What, what are you using on that, that wood to keep it? Well, after the, um, the wood is exposed, we consolidate it immediately using an acrylic resin. And this is to help hold it together, to protect it from drying out more. And, and, and what's that along the side there? Um, on the side, we have uh, some yellow pigment. You can see it here, running along here. So this would be a, a painted boat, like you see on, on all those tomb reliefs? That's right. And what are you going to do with it now? Well, when we finish strengthening the wood, uh, we intend to take the pieces out one by one for more detailed study. But there are 12 of these boats. That's right. Uh, we're only dealing with this one now. Uh, and we thought for many years that there were only 12, but we got a surprise just a few days ago. Let me show you. So you knew that there were 12 boats here? That's right. And just behind you, you see boat number 12. And until just two days ago, I would have sworn that there were no more than 12. But then our excavations this year showed this line of brickwork coming up, and this is boat number 13. But, I mean, there could be lots more of these. You could have hundreds of boats stretched right the way along the desert here. It's possible. Yes. Basically, what you have here is an ancient marina complex. We have a royal fleet moored in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Egypt's secrets are still being revealed. Not long after I left Abydos, a 14th boat was found. Together, they are the world's oldest. This royal fleet of boats, which Matthew Adams and his colleagues are trying to save, was buried near the Mastaba tombs of early kings. After centuries of using the simple Mastaba, burial customs had become more complex. By 2700 BC, Egypt's kings were ready to build tombs on an even greater scale. For centuries, the Mastaba had fulfilled the needs of the dead. But as the Old Kingdom flourished, Egypt reached a peak of prosperity. Now the living pharaohs required something more. Not just a tomb, but a monument to their own greatness. Some 2,600 years before the Christian era, Egypt's pharaohs created the greatest tombs the world has known. The largest contains almost two and a half million limestone blocks, each weighing at least two and a half tons. Beginning in the Old Kingdom, pyramids provided a final resting place for the pharaohs for over 900 years. But these great mausoleums consumed enormous resources. The construction of even smaller pyramids strained Egypt's economy. Even when buried deep within the pyramids, the tombs of the pharaohs were not safe from the robbers who so successfully plundered their remains. Late in the Old Kingdom, Egyptian royalty began to look for other locations where their dead could rest on their long and difficult journey to immortality. By the start of the New Kingdom, around 1570 BC, 
there was a change in religious observance. At the same time, it had become clear that the Mastaba tombs, even the Great Pyramids, were not going to be safe from the ravages of the tomb robbers. So, Egypt's rulers began to look for a more secure site for the tombs of their Great One. They chose this barren valley near Thebes. Pharaohs were carried here to begin their eternal lives in the place that is now known as the Valley of the Kings. The remote isolation of the valley seemed to provide the necessary protection. Construction of a pharaoh's tomb here usually began soon after he succeeded to the throne. Some workers excavated great chambers in the limestone mountains. Others covered the walls with magnificent carvings and paintings. And still others inscribed the tomb with the proper texts to assure the king a successful passage into the underworld. Ancient texts reveal that when the news arrived of the king's death, final decoration and elaborate adornment were hurriedly added to the waiting tomb. After mummification, the pharaoh's body was carried up the Nile by boat. Then an entourage of many priests and mourners accompanied the mummy as its coffin was slowly dragged up the dusty valley path to a waiting tomb. It would have taken many days of ritual and ceremony to bring the mummified body of the pharaoh from the banks of the Nile here to the entrance of the tomb. Since the day the pharaoh died, there will be frenetic activity preparing this place. And now at last, the final act of the king's life would begin. The smell of incense and the sound of chants would fill the air. Priests would lead the procession into the tomb, followed by the mourning royal family. At last, the procession reached this place, the burial chamber deep within the tomb. The mummy was lowered into its waiting sarcophagus, final ritual prayers were chanted, and the heavy lid was moved into place. The mourners returned to the land of the living, and the pharaoh was left in his new home for the afterlife. For over five centuries, the New Kingdom pharaohs buried in this valley had ruled over Egypt at the peak of its grandeur and influence. But a thousand years before the Christian era, the power of Egypt and her kings began to fade. Other, stronger cultures took Egypt's place of power in the Near East and at last occupied her territory. Persians, Hellenistic Greeks and finally Romans controlled the land of the pharaohs. Surprisingly, none of these invaders imposed their religions. Egyptians continued to worship the old gods, and attitudes about death remained remarkably unchanged, a fact dramatically illustrated by a recent discovery. We're in Egypt's great western desert, some 200 miles west of Cairo. It's not a place for a flat tire. It's over 100 degrees out there. Driving across this place, it seems impossible to believe there's anything between here and the Libyan border, except heat and lots of rock and sand. That's not quite true. There are certain places where depressions in the desert floor make it possible to reach down and tap vast supplies of water. The result is five lush oases driving towards one now, Baharia, where the Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass is overseeing work on an incredible discovery. When Egypt was part of the Roman Empire, the vast oasis of Baharia was a thriving community of 10,000 people. The oasis in the 5th century BC was famous for its dates and wine. Today, it is famous for a donkey accident. In 1996, a workman was riding his donkey here in the Baharia oasis. Suddenly, the animal's leg broke through the crust of the desert floor. There was a hole. 
He looked in it, and there were mummies, lots of them. They were the first of what may prove to be the greatest cache of mummies ever found. Almost 4,000 years after the ritual of mummification began, these mummies look a bit different than earlier examples. Most have no coffin. Instead, their faces are covered with a papier-mâché-like mask called cartonnage. But the importance Egyptians placed on preserving the body for the afterlife was unchanged. The gilded cartonnage of these faces has given this place its name. The Valley of the Golden Mummies. Dr. Zahi Hawass of the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities is in charge of the excavation of these tombs. He gave me a tour of the work that has been done so far. So, Doctor, what, which tomb is this? This is uh, the latest tomb that we discovered here in the Valley of the Golden Mummies. In this tomb only, we discovered 41 mummies. There's an amazing number of, of, it is. of mummies here. I've never seen so many mummies. Yeah, together. but what's interesting is that if you look at this type of mummies here, you can see at least three different types of mummies. You can, if you look at the one that has a face that covered with gold, and this is the mummy that completely wrapped with linen only. It's beautiful, isn't it, the way it that's is. done? Yes. Extraordinary work. And this mummy, what's we call covered with cartonnage. And you can see here the scenes of goods and goddesses on them. And look at this a child. We took one child like this for x ray. But this is, I believe, uh, a child within the age of maybe, you can say, two years maximum. And uh, this is beautiful. Th it is. Yeah, in a, and it is in a very good condition. This is why I'm calling, I'm telling you that it is wrong that the people should say that the mummification in the Roman period is, was deteriorated. That's mm. not true. It is in a very good condition. And I believe that this mummy in the middle here, that this man could be the head of the house. Oh, that's why he he's in the middle. The, like, the head yes. of the family. Because he's buried in the center of the, of the room, and they put him in a kind of a, 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 a high level of a stage, and this is why I believe that he's the head of the whole family. It's very moving that a family should be buried together like exactly. this. Exactly. <laughs> is it the same in the other tombs? Each mummy is different from the other mummy. And each mummy tells us a story about the people. And let us go. Into another tomb. Yeah. How many of them are there that you've found so far? Uh, we found in all the tombs until now, uh, 207 mummies. 207 yeah. mummies. In this section here, if you look at this mummy, Ali, you know how they inlaid the eyes here? Oh, that's remarkable. Yeah, it's very beautiful, really, with the gold and the cartonnage. Would this have been a, a, a richer person than yes, most of this, them? This is uh, any mummy that uh, uh, the, you have gold on it means that this man was rich enough. And this one's plaster, isn't it? Yes, but this is, I believe, was a bride. She died before she get married. Oh, I see. And I believe that her family put the makeup on the lips and on these sides, and uh, then they, she can get married in the afterlife. And how many more tombs like this do you think you're going to find here? I believe that I will spend all my life excavating, revealing secrets from the mummies, and revealing lots of stories about the life of the people here. And I said many times that at least we'll discover 10,000 mummies, and I call it the Valley of the Golden Mummies. It is easy to think of the act of mummification as pertaining only to the great pharaohs. It is their tombs that have attracted so much effort and attention from archaeologists. But the tombs at Baharia are filled not with royalty, but with common people, a father, buried with his child resting on his chest, a woman gazing at the mummy of the man she loved. They remind us that the average citizens of ancient Egypt also sought to cheat death's corruption of the body. For most of 4,000 years, mummification was an important part of Egyptian family life.
The Egyptian family's pain at the death of a loved one was just as real as ours would be. And even while they grieved, they knew that the deceased was at that very moment, struggling to survive their great journey through the underworld. Meanwhile, the family had to embark on a long series of rituals and celebrations. The body itself must be mummified to receive the spirit after death. For every family, this was a huge effort and expense. Why did they do it? This was not some morbid obsession. They did it because they cared so much. Mummification is a huge act of love. They absolutely believed that death was not the end of life, but the beginning of eternity.